My name is Professor Helena Teed. I'm an endocrinologist in Monash University and Monash Health in Australia, and I'm also a member of the ISC board. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about a very important condition and an important advance. Polycystic ovary syndrome affects around one in 10 to one in eight women across the globe. It is often thought of as a reproductive condition, probably largely because of the name. However, we know it's a reproductive, metabolic and psychological condition that has quite diverse manifestations across the lifespan. What we've been doing over the last few years is engaging with women who are affected by the condition who explain pretty much across the globe that they have delays in diagnosis and have quite fragmented care, often based on the type of specialist who they're seeing at the time. Also based on the fact that our primary care providers are often not particularly well educated about this diverse condition. It's often dismissed, delays in diagnosis are significant, and the biggest priorities for our patients and indeed from clinicians are not always what the animal models say or what is the specific genetic underpinning of the condition, but actually much more about what the natural history is, what the optimal treatments are, and the best models of care. In response to this, we have led an initiative for international, comprehensive and consistent evidence-based guidelines in this condition. We've done that with women who are affected and with diverse health professionals from six continents. ISE is one of our partners and we have 39 partner organisations covering 71 countries. Together, we have worked for the last 12 months to update and expand the very significant 2018 guidelines. These cover 52 systematic reviews and around 6,000 pages of evidence synthesis into a useful and clinically relevant guideline and a set of tools that both help health, health, health professionals but also significantly support women affected by the condition. Essentially, we've uh, basically transitioned the Rotterdam diagnostic criteria from consensus-based to evidence-based and more tightly defined each one of those criteria of oligoanovulation, polycystic ovarian morphology, or now the inclusion of anti-malarian hormone and anti, sorry, hyperandrogenism. We've also significantly advanced understanding of the natural history of the disease across really high prevalence of psychological depression and anxiety symptoms and of recognition of not only high risk of diabetes, but also of heart disease and other features such as obstructive sleep apnea. Alongside the natural history, we've explored the important psychological features and the importance of treatment, including lifestyle, very much as a supportive strategy for these women to prevent the excess weight gain that they are prone to, and also looked at appropriate models of care, information needs, and the importance of policymakers, educators, and research funders engaging in this condition as a much more diverse condition. Finally, we've explored effective treatment strategies for all the features of condition, including looking at laser and light therapy for hirsutism, combined oral contraceptive pills, metformin, antiandrogens, inositol, anti-obesity agents, and bariatric surgery. We've also uh, very much refined the treatment around infertility, which primarily is related to ovulation induction agents and only may require gonadotrophins or laparoscopic ovarian drilling or surgery and only as third line in, uh, in vitro fertilisation. This body of work is very much supported by translation resources for women, including the PCOS, the Ask PCOS app, which is already used in 186 countries by around 45,000 women. We encourage you to look for these resources and hope that they help you in your everyday practice. And we'd be very happy to hear from you if we can further help you disseminate this important information to improve the healthcare and the lives of women across the globe affected by this condition. Thank you very much.